I know that we all face this campaign of hatred that is being waged against um, the world's only Jewish state. And it's very loud and relentless and sometimes feels like it's ever present. But as I go around the country um, speaking with groups such as yours, what I'm reminded of is that not only do we have right on our side, we also have thousands of activists. And so I think what I'm trying to say to you is, I'm not sure I need to seeing the size of this audience tonight, but you're not alone and you shouldn't <laughs> feel alone. Um, there are activists working through political parties, grassroots groups, um, churches, other civil society organizations, all making, I think, the same case that the Jewish people have the right to self-determination in their historic homeland, and that Israel has a right to live in peace alongside its neighbors. Thank you. So, so thank you um, again for your efforts. Um, and I say that knowing what you do each week. And we need to do so much more of this up and down the country. Getting out there and standing up to those who would give a very different point of view. And I know you've had contact with Stand With Us, and I've done quite a lot of work with Stand With Us, and I think they are such a brilliant organisation. And it's only right if we're asking young people on campus to stand up to some of the most pernicious racism, some of the most appalling anti-Semitism, that we get out and we stand up yeah. to it too. And we do that together in solidarity. And for me, one of the most important characteristics in politics is not tribalism. I didn't join the Labour Party to be in a tribe or because I might like the colour red or something, but you develop a loyalty. But it's solidarity, working together to support each other to achieve those common aims based on those values and principles that we commit to. And that for me is what politics is all about. And if it isn't about speaking the truth when that moment comes, about standing up for your beliefs and having the courage of your conviction, then I don't know what politics is for. And I just think people who won't or can't do that shouldn't. Um, so you'll be aware that I left the Labour Party in February. Um, 38 years is a very long time. And it, I'm not going to pretend it wasn't a hard thing to do, it was. Those few days leading up to do it, obviously I've been talking about it for some time with people very close to me, like Ian Austin. Um, but, you know, leading up to it, those last couple of days, they're very, very difficult because you've got to the point where you know what you need to do. Whatever anybody else is going to do, you answer to your own conscience, you live with your own conscience, nobody else's. The fact that nobody else was going to leave for the reasons I was leaving, other than <coughs> Luciana, um, and then a few days later, Ian, it's neither here nor there. And when it comes to that crunch point, when you've made those commitments to a community and others of the same values, then you know when the moments come. And I'm kind of relieved that I was able to do the right thing at that point because you don't really know if you're going to... It's not courage like, um, you know, people in physical combat or something. It's not that kind of courage where um, you do something even though you're very scared. But I think, it, I think we do need to have moral courage and the courage um, to live by what we said we believe in. So it was kind of a relief once I had done it. First of all, I could say the things I, I really thought. I didn't want to be suspended from the Labour Party because I wanted to do it on my terms so that the message I had to give was not in retaliation for something, but because <coughs> of the things I believed and because of what was happening in the Labour Party. 
So strange as it seems, it is actually a relief at the point when you've, you've made the move. And I don't think I'll ever regret it. I do have people say to me, you've probably sacrificed your political career. Well, I could work that out before I did it, you know? I knew exactly what I was doing. And I don't have any regrets. I feel much better. I can look myself in the mirror and I can look people in the eye who I gave commitments to about standing shoulder to shoulder with them. And I can say for sure that I really do have a commitment to the values I've espoused for over 40 years. And that is a huge relief, so I'd recommend it to anybody and to all other MPs. Though I wouldn't put them on the spot, it's up to them. Nobody pushed or forced me or took away my choice or made me feel I had to do something. I made that decision. Um, I've always been immensely proud of the things that we achieved as Labour in government under Tony Blair and Gordon Brown. And nothing that has happened since takes away that pride. Um, I returned to Parliament in 2015. I lost my seat in 2010. Um, it was a difficult boundary review. The, the trend was against us. Gordon wasn't doing well in the polls. Um, but still and all, you know, we were hoping we might just do it, but we didn't. It is a lot easier to win than lose, I can tell you that, it feels a lot nicer. But we lost, and we only lost narrowly, and we fought very hard to get the seat back. And I say we, because almost everything you achieve or do in politics, you do as a team. It, often there's a figurehead or a leader, obviously, a leader of a team or a leader, you know, a chair of a select committee, a minister, um, a prime minister. but. None of them can achieve anything without that solidarity I was talking about. Someone told me that um, a, a, a man, a leader without followers, is just a man going for a walk. So I think that's very true. I think that's true. <laughs> so I returned to politics, to Parliament in 2015. I was expecting kind of spelling opposition, that we'd all roll up our sleeves and we'd help Labour to recover from that defeat and help to get us into a position where we could win back people's trust and confidence and return to government so that we could tackle their priorities. And then Jeremy Corbyn was elected leader of the Labour Party, which was an unbelievable yeah. event at the time, but I'm not sure we realised just how cataclysmic this was going to be. And it is still shocking how fast this change in the Labour Party came about. For more than three years, alongside many, many decent colleagues, um, I worked with them to save the Labour Party from the inside. And I can say it's a party I, I loved. I loved it for what it wanted to do. I think it, it, it has been the most important movement for social change and social reform and social justice that this country has ever seen. I think it achieved so much throughout its life if we go back to 1906. You could go a bit further back, I think, in Scotland, couldn't you? Yeah. Um, we'll settle on 1906 for now. Um, it's not my fault Scott's got there before us. Yeah. <laughs> And I think it's an absolute tragedy what's happened to it because those values are so important and never has the need been greater for progressive policies um, and based on fairness and decency and respect for each other and social justice. Never has that need been greater. And we find ourselves in the midst of this national crisis of Brexit and what that might deliver to people of this of these nations. Um, so, at the end of the day, I concluded that my values hadn't changed. I hadn't left the Labour Party, it left me. Um, Labour was once a friend to Israel and a home to many British Jews. Um, it was now <coughs> institutionally anti Semitic and led by a man who has made it that way. It's like a virus, like an infection. Um, after watching, I mean, there was a trigger for me leaving, 
obviously I've been chair of Labour Friends of Israel um, since 19, uh, 2015, and I became a supporter of Labour Friends of Israel. It's a parliamentary organisation in the main. Uh, it has a mailing list, but its supporters are all members of parliament. It's not an affiliate of the Labour Party, which is why I remain chair at present, much to the intense irritation of Jeremy Corbyn. <laughs> Petty, isn't it? That's <laughs> small things. Um, you know, I... I, I I had been a supporter since 97, I became chair in, in 2015, and um, the trigger was Luciana saying institutional anti-Semitism. I thought it was something, a, a, a huge step away from where we'd been. And I knew what she said was true. And although I didn't leave with the Change UK people. I saw no reason not to join them a, a day or so later. It's much easier to be in a team in Parliament. It's very hard to do terribly much as one single on, on your own independent. But that wasn't why I left. And the moment when I was deciding to leave, I decided to do as much media as I could, to be as public as I could, because I really left to stop Jeremy Corbyn ever getting into number 10. It was that important to me. It's that serious a threat, I think. Um, and I think that week, I think history will look back and that week will be the beginning of the end for him, whenever it comes. And hopefully it will be more than that, that it will break this cult that exists around him. And however much the next leader might not be great, as long as it's not John McDonnell, we'll be moving <laughs> forward slightly. <laughs> So it's also a great relief because I could no longer tell my constituents to vote Labour and to put Jeremy Corbyn into number 10. And as long as I was a Labour MP, I couldn't say it and I was giving them a message that I didn't believe in, that in fact I thought was detrimental to them. I use the term institutional anti-Semitism advisedly and very deliberately. There's no question hundreds of Jewish party members up and down the country um, have suffered the same or similar fate to Luciana. And they've witnessed fellow members openly deploy vile anti-Semitic tropes and express a repugnant hatred of Israel. And they've seen those uh, anti-Semites go totally unpunished in comparison to other people with minor misdemeanors in party terms that are not about being vile or racist towards anyone, um, not be called to, uh, 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 you know, not in any shape or uh, form be punished at all. So if you, if you um, want to make anti-Semitic remarks about someone in the party, you can do that unless there's enough of a storm caused that the party have to act. But if you just want to say something you think about a particular policy area, you might find yourself um, uh, you know, out on a limb and suspended for no good reason. And I know so many decent Labour Party members who've been suspended for almost nothing. And they live in this suspended limbo month after month after month, and lots of them are young members as well, it's a disgrace. Um, and they're being persecuted, whilst people who say some of the most unbelievable things that could never be reconciled with Labour values are allowed to go on and say those things time and time again, to run meetings, to get elected, to put themselves forward for office, and to work very hard to deselect other good and decent members. Um, and we're told that the racism that we've witnessed simply doesn't exist. And their motivations for calling it out are somewhat suspect. The notion of institutional racism, that was first outlined in 1999 in the police inquiry, the public inquiry, into the failure of London's Metropolitan Police to deal with the racist murder of Stephen Lawrence. 
Do you remember how big an issue that was and how serious that was? And the McPherson report, that inquiry defined um, institutional racism as the collective failure of an organisation to provide an appropriate and professional service to people because of their colour, culture or ethnic origin. It said that failure can be seen or detected in processes, attitudes and behaviour which amount to discrimination through unwitting prejudice, ignorance, thoughtlessness and racist stereotyping which disadvantage minority ethnic people and it suggested it persists because of the failure of the organisation to openly and adequately to recognise and address the existence and causes by policy, example and leadership. It, you, many of you will have heard of Professor Alan Johnson who has argued that there is no question after he has studied 130 <coughs> individual cases of alleged anti-Semitism in the party that Labour clearly clearly meets that criteria. So we don't need to question Luciana's conclusion on the basis of our own personal experience, a young Jewish woman MP driven out of the Labour Party by abuse. <laughs> we don't need to question, was she right to make that leap from the notion that it's a few bad apples to its institutional anti-Semitism, institutional racism. There is so much evidence that that is exactly what we're dealing with. It is particularly cruel irony, I think, that the Equality and Human Rights Commission, a body established under Gordon Brown, which epitomised Labour's commitment to equality, is now investigating the party. The only other party subject to such an investigation is the fascist BNP. And I'm sure you're all um, going to be aware of the documentary on Wednesday. And that's an important landmark documentary. Um, this party, this Labour Party, sadly, is not fit, morally or politically, to govern Britain or any country. And we live in a democracy at the moment, and we need to say so. We need to say it is not fit to govern. It's not just Jeremy Corbyn. If a new leader is going to emerge, be elected, they need to know that what's happening to him will happen to them if they don't change the Labour Party. So I could no longer, by representing Labour and campaigning for it, suggest that it was fit to govern. I'm often asked if I think that Jeremy Corbyn is an anti-Semite. Um, and my answer to that is that I don't believe that you can separate the terrible crisis that besets Labour from his own behaviour and beliefs. His well-documented associations with a string of Holocaust deniers, terrorists and anti-Semites, I think has blinded him to the nature of modern-day anti-Jewish hatred. His beliefs in his own moral rectitude and his impeccable anti-racist credentials makes it impossible for him to engage with the crisis that has enveloped Labour. It prevents him from taking any personal responsibility and accepting the hard truth that many of his actions have led huge numbers of British Jews to conclude that he is an anti-Semite. But without such engagement and recognition, there's no real possibility of change. He cannot be the agent of change. Instead, on each occasion when his actions have been questioned, Corbyn has reacted with a combination of denial, anger, self-justification. He truly believes that in all of this, that he is the real victim. And it does seem amazing when you got the chance to speak with him, God help you. He does, <laughs> he does really think that's the case. He is the victim. He is outraged that this label should be attached to him. 
the very label I was very determined to attach to him on the day I resigned. I did a newspaper interview at five o'clock the afternoon before with Henry Zeffen from um, The Times. Um, and he promised not to release it till 10 o'clock that night when the paper goes up online to give me a chance to um, change my mind if I wanted to. They were terrible five hours. I wish I'd never took that opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> you just put it up. Um, I, I didn't want him to go sooner because I didn't want to do news night because I wanted to start the day with the Today programme because that sets the political agenda, really, the news agenda for the day. So I deliberately, I knew exactly what I was doing. I knew I'd suddenly arrived and I was important because they sent me a radio car <laughs> so I could talk with, with, with really good sound quality to Martha Kearney. Um, I, I mean, even when I was a minister, I never got a radio car. You know, <laughs> I was sort of down there, they oh, we're not interested. <laughs> oh, right. Um, so this car pulls up on the front. And then during that day, I did just, I can't remember how many interviews people like Vanessa Phelps and Endless News, Sky News sent a satellite van to my constituency. I said, I want you to do it here. They said, why there? Why here? Because this is where I'm the MP. And I want to say, in the Labour Party now, we are forced to con consider this terrible agenda day in, day out and stand up to what he's doing to the Labour Party, when really, here's my hospital behind us that's had its A&E yeah. closed. This is what we should be able yeah. to be concentrating on. So they came along with a huge satellite van. I thought, I should have done this years ago. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't really have the cause to, so. <laughs> but I spent the whole day absolutely super gluing that label to his head and i know that sounds mean and nasty but you know sometimes it's going to take this kind of action to really expose what is going on and i don't feel bad about it and i don't think he can take away that label now because a few days later ian austin came out and did the same thing and i'm so pleased he did and i know he is Neither one of us has ever regretted it. And he knew what he was doing and we talked about it. And we both knew that somebody has to draw back that veil and say, this is who he is. And both Ian and I would have been considered very committed Labour Party members. I suppose what people did describe as tribal. So I think it was a shock that we walked and that we said what we said. And I think it has um, exposed these politics. And I do believe that in the future, when the history is written, that that is the beginning of the end that week. Not just Ian and I, Luciana and the others, all the others who left that week, Labour and Conservative were really brave in saying, this isn't what politics should be about. Either the way Brexit's being handled, the extremism in both the parties, the fact that that's what the politicians are looking at all the time and the people in the middle can go hang. Everybody, I think, knew the truth of what was said that <clears throat> week. And whatever happens to our parties, whatever happens to us, whether we ever get re-elected or don't, I feel that we did the right thing that it was the best thing to do, and it helped to shift those tectonic plates. We changed the political weather. We haven't yet changed the landscape, but you've got to make a start. And even though you don't know what impact it's going to have, and whether it is going to be worthwhile, you know when it has to be done. And you don't always get the luxury of acting, knowing what the outcome will be. Sometimes you've just got to take that risk because it's the right thing to do. And I pay tribute to every one of those MPs who did that that week, even if it wasn't all for the same reasons that some of us did it. It was the right thing to do. And it said there's something rotten here. And there is. Um, I hope that, you know, and I, I yeah, that that kind of cult-like um, behaviour towards Corbyn from his supporters I hope that we've started to 
put the end to that. During that week when we left, they dropped six points in the poll. Tom Watson made his move to form Future Britain to really try and fight it from the inside, and I pay tribute to that. I support that. So that's the right thing to do. There was a significant shift that week. Chris Williamson was suspended. He wasn't going to be till that happened. So I think that difference. And sometimes, you know, when you took a risk and you feel good about it, I think it's okay to say, um, I think that worked, because we want to encourage other people to do the, to do the next bit. Um, but Corbyn's behaviour in relation to anti-Semitism is not some kind of accident. It, it is a matter of political calculation. I know people see him as a kind of avuncular figure. <laughs> he has seen how he has managed to weather political storms, which would surely, surely have caused those with more shame and greater self-awareness to have tendered their resignations. We are in unbelievable times, the things he gets away with. Over the past year alone, he survived the revelation that he praised a grotesque anti-Semitic mural that depicted vile caricatures of Jews playing a Monopoly-like game on the backs of the poor. He callously brushed aside the hurt and pain caused to the victims' families when it was discovered that he had laid wreaths at the graves of those who masterminded the brutal torture and murder of 11 Israeli athletes at the 1972 Munich Olympics. And we need to remind ourselves of these things because they are shocking in the extreme that the leader of Labour Party, the first line of defence against this kind of thing should be the very perpetrator of it. And he arrogantly ignored the outcry when he was shown to have praised the fascinating and electrifying, his words, words of Hamas terrorists who had recently been freed from prison. Men who, among many other heinous crimes, had murdered Israeli teenagers queuing outside a nightclub, young people out with their friends in a pizzeria, and Holocaust survivors enjoying a Passover Seder. And as these examples illustrate, this isn't simply about Corbyn's personality or the protection his political supporters provide him. It's also about the anti-Zionist beliefs, shaped by and intertwined with an anti-Western, perverted form of post-colonial far-left politics, which are absolutely central to his world view. Corbyn used to be more overt about these beliefs throughout the 1980s. He sponsored and supported the Labour movement campaign for Palestine. That pledged to oppose manifestations of Zionism and eradicate Zionism from the Labour Party. But Corbyn's continuing rock-solid commitment to anti-Zionism was totally evident in his behaviour last summer. Despite the outcry over Labour's refusal to adopt the International Holocaust Alliance uh, uh, Remembrance definition of anti-Semitism, despite the united pleas of the Jewish community and unprecedented calls for action by rabbis from across the communal divide, and despite the revelations about his own past actions, which I outlined, Corbyn had but one overriding priority, to push for the right of anti-Semites in the Labour Party to be allowed to describe Israel as a racist endeavour. This is not some peculiar, offensive, but marginal action. It's ideological lineage, I believe, can be traced back to the, the notorious vote four decades ago when an unholy alliance of the Soviet bloc, and remember Corbyn's connection to the Soviet bloc and his support for them, um, and the Arab states had the United Nations label Zionism a form of racism and racial discrimination. Dave Rich, the author of 
think an acclaimed study of the left's Jewish problem has argued this was the most important moment in the history of post-war left-wing anti-Zionism. <coughs> the pernicious legacy of that has lasted for years. It provides anti-Zionists with a, a confidence and a platform and a supposed moral legitimacy for casting the Jewish people's right to self-determination as a somehow unique, uh, uniquely wrong, somehow uniquely wrong and evil. <coughs> the anti-Israel activism we see today has its roots in that vote, I believe. And that effort to equate Zionism with racism, that is underpinned started, underpinned, and perpetuated by that vote. It's no surprise, therefore, that even at moments of acute political pressure, uh, Corbyn was determined to, to continue to propagate this vicious lie. In the face of such an attitude, it's not at all credible to believe that Corbyn can ever rid the Labour Party of the scourge of anti-Zionist anti-Semitism. In the final analysis, such a conviction on the part of the leader and his closest allies will always outweigh empty platitudes about fighting anti-Semitism and promises to change rules and processes to do so. And that's why people like Luciana talked about institutional anti-Semitism, why I acted in solidarity with her, and why Ian Austin did the same. Since I left um, the Labour Party, I've spoken frequently about what I've learned about the problems of anti-Semitism within it. And I, I believe there are five <coughs> principal lessons to be learned. And the first, is this, it is so, so important to confront every instance of anti-Semitism and confront it from the very beginning. <clears throat> Once that virus begins to take, it will spread with remarkable speed and ease if it's not challenged and stopped. I said earlier, we, were, we are shocked at the speed with which this took hold of the Labour Party. And for far too long, many people assured themselves that this was just a few bad apples. You did hear that phrase. People said this, and people were willing to stand up at the PLP and say, we're getting all this out of perspective. And of course, you've heard what Chris Williamson said. So by the time the party has become institutionally anti-Semitic, as Labour has, the task of rooting out the Jew haters is near impossible. The second lesson, I think, is it's just vital to understand that a far-left leadership cannot be engaged with in the manner that one normally deals with those in politics with whom we disagree. The far-left's manner of operating is secretive, it's closed, it's obsessive, uh, it's obsessed with purity, it's focused on rooting out perceived internal enemies. This means that any engagement is highly unlikely to produce substantive results and could indeed be exploited and manipulated for purposes that would be very detrimental to our cause. It can be made to uh, look like you're giving them cover, that they're really trying to do something about this problem. And it's not as bad as you might think, else why would decent people who are not anti-Zionists, why would we be engaging with them? So you have to be very, very careful about that engagement. My third lesson is it's crucial to develop a clear critique with red lines that you're not willing to compromise on. I freely admit I cross more red lines than I ever thought I would till I got to that trigger point and could cross no more. And I think that's true of a lot of Labour MPs. I think they're horrified that they're still in the party. I know they feel very strongly about it and I know they're very upset about it. And I hope 
that working together in solidarity, their actions can make a difference as well. Um, there are too many moderates in the Labour Party who tackled the problem, um, you know, they, they kind of rested their critique on, on a view that, um, well, on a view about Corbynism's political viability. And of course that went out of the window in 2017. That no longer could be said. I look back now and I hope that was peak Corbynism, but it wasn't, um, it wasn't the right critique at the time. That critique collapsed. You need to know what your red lines are. And we need to work together more in Parliament to make that decision about what those red lines are and why. The fourth lesson I've learnt is it's necessary that we recognise that the issue of anti-Zionist anti-Semitism is one that really does pose challenges to those of us who are friends of Israel. There's too many people in the political world, let alone among the wider public, who simply don't understand the character of this problem. And why we're, while, while we're trying to explain, <coughs> for instance, why you know, denying the Jewish people um, a right to self-determination or drawing comparisons between the policies of Israel and the Nazis, why we're while we're trying to explain how deeply anti-Semitic that is, our opposition have actually developed a simple but pernicious retort, and that is that we're just trying to shut down all criticism of Israel. We urgently need to think again, I believe, about how to better convey our case and explain the nature of modern anti-Semitism, because I don't think we've really got that message through. Um, and I believe that we need a massive campaign of public education in order to um, achieve that. Professor Vernon Bogdanov has outlined a case that, it is both that is both compelling and could form the basis of such a campaign. And it begins with showing how anti-Semitism began to mutate in the late 20th century. In the 19th century, anti-Semitism sought to deprive Jews of their civil rights. It then sought to deprive them of their liberty and their lives. This led inexorably to the tragedy of the Shoah. Modern anti-Semitism begins with the premise that Jews alone should be deprived of their right to self-determination. This leads inexorably to the, 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 the destruction of the Jewish homeland the safe haven that they built in the shadow of the Holocaust, the State of Israel. And Professor Bogdana puts it, the oldest anti-Semitism, sorry, the oldest anti-Semitism insisted that Jews had no place in the national community. The new anti-Semitism insists that Israel has no place in the international community. So the effort to paint Israel as uniquely evil and a pariah state, and many of you, if you've been on that store, will have heard this from Palestine, Palestine Solidarity Campaign in particular, perpetuate these views. A pariah state, one to which um, all his actions show that Corbyn is committed to this view. The BDS movement is, of course, at the forefront of this effort, and while I do absolutely believe that BDS and anti-Semitism are inextricably linked, I also know that there are all those who support it, particularly among the young, who do so out of a, a, a desire to do something, especially when the prospects of a, a viable peace process seem so remote. And that's why, finally, I believe we need to offer those who are genuinely concerned about the conflict between Israel and the Palestinians, we need to offer a cause for hope. We need to direct their energies and their enthusiasm into an agenda which brings Israelis and Palestinians together, not drives them apart. And that's why I'm a strong supporter of the campaign for an international fund for Israeli-Palestinian peace, which would invest 
in people to people projects. And it's why I'm delighted about the recent introduction of legislation in the US Congress. It has bipartisan backing to establish the Partnership Fund for Peace. It's a radical, ambitious, peace-building agenda. It can help foster um, conflict-ending uh, conflict values of trust, of reconciliation, of coexistence, whilst also providing creative and imaginative alternative to the destructive and dangerous ideology that underpins BDS. And I think it, it builds constituencies for peace. It's modelled on the International Fund for Ireland, which was started at the height of the Troubles in Ireland in the 1980s. And no one thought that could make a difference. It's raised over £700 million. Most of it now from prim, pri, uh, private donations. It has an independent board. It helped to fund some of those women's organisations that were so important. It built resilience and it built in this constituency for peace. Even now, when <coughs> things are difficult in Ireland, the impact of that peace building is there. To be resilient when things are still difficult uh, in Northern Ireland. And not helped by Brexit, of course. <laughs> you know. um, I think there are, you know, what's the future look like then? Well, you know, there are many who can be described as well-intentioned, um, who maybe have no interest in coexistence, peace, and a two-state solution. Their goal, I think, is, um, I think, the destruction of the state of Israel. I don't think Jeremy Corbyn or his followers are well-intentioned. And I know there are those who think they are, and this needs to be re revealed. Um, I believe that we're here to make it to Downing Street and the clique of Marxists and Trotskyists who surround him. It would be exceptionally dangerous. Um, and this is part of why, although it sounds very awful, but the desire to stop him ever getting into number 10, I think they would threaten Britain's role in the Western Alliance, um, Britain's role as a proponent of liberal democratic values around the world. I think they would gleefully wreck Britain's increasingly close relationship with Israel, destroying the many bonds that exist between our two countries. And yes, I think they would pose a clear and present danger to the Jewish community here in Britain, an existential threat, as Jonathan Goldstein the head of the Jewish Leadership Council has put it. Um, what is it? What do I mean by that? I don't think anybody's suggesting that the Corbyn government would strip Jews of their civil rights, but it would endanger their right to equal treatment by the state. Uh, given how Labour has treated anti-Semitism within its own ranks, for instance, I think we can be sure that anti-Jewish hatred um, would be treated differently perhaps more leniently than other forms of racism. Jewish students who already face a tough time on some campuses are likely to find the atmosphere darken, I would suggest, with the government siding with their tormentors. And I think we can expect the voice of the tiny minority of Corbyn supporting anti-Zionist hard-left Jews to be elevated above those of the vast majority of the Jewish community. And of course, given the strong attachment British Jews naturally feel towards Israel, it will be a Corbyn administration's overt hostility towards the Jewish state that will lie at the heart of tensions between it and the community. In practical terms, we'd see the sympathies the Labour front bench currently displays turned into the UK's foreign and diplomatic policies. The UK would join those states intent on demonising and delegitimising the state of Israel at every point and turn. And it would be lined up behind every <coughs> UN resolution which attacks the Jewish state, no matter how one-sided, no matter how inflammatory the language. And it would back every international effort 
aimed at isolating Israel. Naturally, the far less anti-imperialist sympathies would see a warming in relations with states such as Iran. Corbyn himself has in the past made clear his desire for Britain to establish normal, proper, good relations with Iran, which means an end of sanctions and full diplomatic recognition. And we can expect the contrast between Labour's rush to condemn Israeli actions in Gaza and its calls for caution and care when condemning the Assad regime's war crimes or Tehran's abuses of human rights to be even starker when it has the full weight of the Foreign Office and the UK's governmental and diplomatic machine behind it. Unsurprisingly, I don't think Israel would be keen on sharing vital intelligence with a government such as that, which is strengthening its ties with Israel's enemies, nor, I doubt, would Israel consider a government led by a man who's described Hamas and Hezbollah as friends to be a reliable ally in the fight against terrorism. And finally, economic, <coughs> academic, cultural ties between Britain and Israel, they're likely to be swiftly cut. A Corbyn government's sympathies will be with the BDS movement. Even if that takes time for those sympathies to manifest themselves in terms of concrete actions, we can expect a chilling effect from the moment Corbyn walks in to number 10. And what, what Israeli business would want to invest in Britain or partner with a British business that is led by Corbyn? Which Israeli student or academic will choose to study or teach in the UK when they could go to friendlier nations overseas? And why would Israel theatre troops, dance companies or sports teams tour Britain when they can be sure that the authorities would adequate, would not, they cannot be sure that they would be adequately protected against the inevitable protests. But I think we need to recognise that why do we need a massive public education campaign and how can that happen? Well, it starts with what you are doing. It starts with each one of us. But I think it's really important that we, we recognise that this isn't just about the Jews. <coughs> the chief rabbi, uh, Rabbi Mervis, said to me, anti-Semitism isn't just a problem for the Jews. But we need to explain why anti-Semitism is a threat to us all, Jew and non-Jew alike. There's an excellent new study of anti-Semitism by Rabbi Julia Newberger, and this captures this point very well indeed. And she talks of the paranoid conspiracy theories and the tropes which accompany them, which infuse anti-Semitism. And she notes how these are now beginning to be seen and heard among individuals <coughs> who hitherto didn't have an anti-Semitic bone in their body. <laughs> but she's, she's right, she's not talking about Corbyn there, she's talking well beyond that. And she concludes with these words, this stuff spreads, that's why it matters. It matters because it smells, it rots the body politic, it leads to worse, and it renders rational thought incapable in the face of an ineluctable active theory of why they are to blame. It destroys normal, rational, evidence-based thought. We have defined the problem, we have understood the danger, and now we must take it on and defeat it. We must find the words and we must educate. And I finish on, on, on this point. We could not understand for a very long time why there wasn't more cut through about what was happening in the Labour Party, why there wasn't more cut through. Did a series of focus groups and they came back and they said to us, when we do the focus groups and we say anti-Semitism, there's a kind of, oh, reaction. But when we say racism against Jews, then there's a real reaction. Then people say, no, that's not something I think the British character is willing to tolerate. I think British people are good and decent people fundamentally and committed to a liberal democracy. 
And we've got to educate them, and it starts with us and everything that we can do. And if we ever thought one individual can't make a difference, we only all have to look back in history at many examples, and we only have to look at this cult that has existed around Corbyn. Each and every one of us can make a real difference. We might not be the leader, we might not be going to be the person who's celebrated or gets to speak at Glastonbury, but we might well be the person that turns somebody else on who is going to be that person. And every time you speak to someone, never ever underestimate the power and the influence of word of mouth. Thank you.